Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and this is uh, part four of my sixth generation game consoles retrospective. Uh, again, this series would never have happened if you guys hadn't asked for it. I had no intention of ever doing this, so thank you for requesting it, and I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you enjoy this part. And stay tuned to the final part. Uh, but this is about the uh, Microsoft Xbox, the third console released in the sixth generation of game consoles. This was interesting because this was Microsoft's first game console ever. Um, and the first time we had a new entrance into the console race, really, since Sony entered with the PS1. Microsoft did a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong. Uh, it was interesting, actually. This, um, this console was released in November of 2001, and they released it uh, first in New York City, which is uh, the biggest city in the United States. Save for Mexico City, it's the biggest city in North America. And, of course, it falls on the East Coast time zone, so it's like the first time zone to get hit, except for certain parts of Canada. Um, so they had this big launch party to, you know, get everybody amped up for the Xbox two months after 9-11. Uh, now, it was the first big public celebration type of party in New York City since 9-11 happened. And I remember Microsoft making a big deal about that. You have to understand if you're not an American, 9-11 really traumatized the American psyche. And I gotta give Microsoft some credit for trying to do some damage control, I guess, if that makes any sense, uh, for that. By having this big party and celebration for bringing this thing into the public and making a big public fun safe event in New York City. Because uh, I don't think prior to that that you had big launches in New York City like that, but I could be wrong. Yeah, Bill Gates himself actually uh, was the one selling consoles at first. I know he sold the first one. I don't know if he kept selling other. I mean, when I say he sold it, I mean like he was at the register, he rang the guy up, and gave him his Xbox. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Um, now that it's also interesting, of course, because this is the first American uh, game console since the Atari Jaguar. And when I say American, I mean engineered. Uh, the Atari Jaguar was the last one that was actually built in the U.S. This was, of course, built in parts of Asia, like everything is. Um, but yeah, so they kind of used that as part of, like, the pride type of thing. Like, you know, Xbox, come on, America is coming back. You know, that's just what it was. And contrary to popular belief, despite this, what I just told you, the American... Americans do not typically associate the Xbox as like America, you know, like as an American brand that we make a big deal out of. I, I, know, I know a lot of Europeans accuse us of that, but I've never known anyone to buy an Xbox over, uh, an Xbox thing over a PlayStation thing because America might it. I've never heard anyone do that. In fact, I would be surprised if most Americans even know it's American or don't assume that Sony and Nintendo are also American. It's just not, you got to trust me, it's not a big deal here. And if, if you are an American and you found another part of the country that does know that and makes a big deal about it, please tell me where you live because I would that surprises me. But anyway, so this console, um, hands down, the most powerful console of the sixth generation, uh, way ahead of the others in a lot of regards. I mean, that, even if you hated this machine, I think you acknowledge that. Um, and... Uh, it is personally, with the exception of the Dreamcast, it is my favorite in that generation. Now, it's largely my favorite because of how many amazing games exist in that generation as a whole, and because it was the console I played my multiplats on. So, you're getting a lot of the best games on this console, therefore you kind of associate that console as being part of the best. Makes sense. Um, before we go into the games, though, I want to talk about some of these other things you see here. Now, Microsoft did a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong with this console. They had, uh, this was, like I said, it was their first one, and they had dabbled in the gaming industry before. They helped Sega make the Dreamcast. You know, they were a big part of that, and then they thought they'd learned enough and they could make their own. And so they released this. One of the mistakes they made right off, off the bat was this controller. Now, this is called the Duke, or at least it's been dubbed the Duke controller. This was packed in originally and is a horrible controller. Uh, it's often compared to and said it's inspired by the Dreamcast controller. I find that insulting to the Dreamcast because the Dreamcast controller is not that bad. Um, yeah, so when they launched this thing in Japan, because Japanese people, in all honesty, are just smaller than us, America, um, <laughs> uh, they had to give it a smaller controller. 
and that's called the controller S. Now, they found that a lot of people were importing this thing back to the States and back to Canada and Europe and so on, so they said, eh, fuck it, let's just release this with the Xbox from now on. So, that's what we all got. Um, that, if you ever wondered why you had two controllers, there you go. Uh, right before launch, they pissed us all off by telling us, yes, yes, it'll have DVD support. It'll be awesome. You'll love DVD support. By the way, you have to buy this fucking thing. Which uh, none of us liked because we were told out of the box to be able to play DVDs. And then, like, like almost, I, I want to say last minute, I mean, it, it must have been like a couple weeks beforehand at best, where they told us, you're going to have to buy this dongle thing for an extra $30. It comes with a remote and this dongle and it unlocks DVD support, which I think was a really stupid decision and really hurt their ability to be competitive with the PS2 because the PS2 could easily advertise, like, dude, you don't need any stupid shit like that. Right out of the box, DVDs. And you couldn't do that with the Xbox, which was really dumb. But eventually they realized that and they started bundling it in with the console directly. Traditionally, I don't bring up if a console was easily modded and what the benefits were, etc. In this case, I will uh, because Modded Xboxes, while I, while I have them, uh, I never use them really for emulators, but if you include the ability to have emulators on this thing, it is like hands down one of the greatest consoles of all time. It plays like everything before it. Um, and it can just do so many other things that were so surprising to us. Uh, media playback was obviously a huge thing because uh, we weren't used to that at all. Um, region free became region free like immediately, which was awesome. And that's because of the architecture of this thing. It is essentially a PC. You know, hell, its name originates from DirectX. Uh, it was originally called the DirectX Box. Like, that was the code name for it, and then they just dropped it to Xbox. And if you open it up, it's really nothing but PC parts. I mean, it's an over-the-counter hard drive and CD drive and so on. And uh, that made it very easy to mod. So it is worth noting that a lot of people did that. In fact, I would think more people who still have this console have it modded than don't. Because it was also very easy to mod. You could do it through mod chips or you could do it through software. And the other reason it's significant is that uh, I remember there being a story where they, they got a beefed up modded Xbox over at Microsoft. They brought it to Bill Gates himself. This is an interesting story, it really is. They brought him this um, beefed up Xbox full of like, you know, this huge hard drive, all sorts of games are on it, emulators and everything. And they brought it to him and they told him like, we have to go after these guys, we gotta shut everybody down, we gotta sue them, we have to destroy them. And Bill Gates, this is why that man was a, is brilliant. He goes, why? This is amazing. He said, how can we use this? He's like, these, these are great ideas. And they incorporate a lot of those ideas, the ones they could legally, into the Xbox 360. Such as, you know, ripping your games and uh, the idea of an arcade type of thing, you know, and media playback. It was, they just learned from modders, and I think that was a really smart move. And it all originates from this, basically through, a, you know, a back door in the console, but it, it is what it is. And it, I think that was really smart of them to understand and not just sue the shit out of people for. One of the things that this console does that's amazing to me, and it was amazing when it first came out, was the fact that it had that hard drive. And on the hard drive, you could save all your games internally, uh, like game saves. And it was the idea was like, oh, it's unlimited save space. You'll never run out of this, which is still mind-blowing, um, sort of, now. <laughs> um, and you never needed a memory card, and that was awesome. And it had an extra feature in it uh, that was awesome, where that never gets talked about. But it, you had the ability to rip music CDs to the hard drive. And you could listen to them digitally through that if you wanted to. Or... Some games would actually allow you to use that music in the game. And one such example is the Grand Theft Auto games. Uh, this is uh, the double pack of three in Vice City, and I think San Andreas did this too. Where, you know, in these games, you know, you have radio stations that play music and you play, uh, you know, uh, just narration, people just talking. There was an additional channel that would allow you to play whatever music you had ripped to it. So it becomes more of your own unique gaming experience. And that is awesome. And that was just symbolic of everything the Xbox kind of did. It always took whatever the multiplat was and just kind of added a little bit more to it. That was one of the features. And in the case of this one, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a, a big deal about Grand Theft Auto back when this uh, came out where Rockstar, who made the game, had this exclusive deal with Sony where they weren't allowed to release Grand Theft Auto games for any other consoles. And Rockstar actually found a loophole in the contract that allowed them to release it on uh, the Xbox, uh, provided they made certain changes. 
And the changes were subtle little things, like his shoes in Grand Theft Auto 3 were different, textures were nicer, uh, they ran it at a better, a higher resolution, they added that music support like I talked about. So basically you always got, the multiplat was always the definitive version when it was on the Xbox, and that was really cool. Some games actually went to the trouble of just flat out telling you what the Xbox extras were. Like here's Silent Hill 2. On the back it just straight up says Xbox extras. Uh, additional playable character, more secrets revealed, new areas, weapons and items, enhanced graphics and lighting effects. Usually the tradition was with any multiplat, the Xbox version is just going to have more stuff in it. And because it was just vastly superior hardware that they could really, you know, they build these things obviously on PCs. Probably at the time they were probably building a lot of them on DirectX. So they ported the best over to the Xbox and then they just looked the best. So they were able to do more things with it. And I respect him for actually just telling you straight up, like, look, this is what the Xbox version does additionally, okay? And I think that's cool. Um, now, my experience with the Xbox when it came out at first was I didn't really like it, um, <clears throat> despite how much I'm praising it now. When it came out, I didn't care for it too much. I did buy it right away. Um, I bought it, I pre-ordered it from an EB Games, which no longer exists in this country. In Canada, you guys still have it. Uh, now it's basically merged into GameStop. And I remember having to put a down payment of like $100 on the thing. And then I went in to pick it up, and they said, well, okay, yeah, you can, you can pick it up now, but uh, here's the thing, uh, you have to buy three games with it. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, you know, we don't have a whole lot of them, and uh, we just got to make sure they sell the, the appropriate amount. And I was like, but I pre-ordered it. And they're like, yeah, we know, that's why you can buy it now. And I was like... <laughs> You have to understand the console was like three hundred dollars, so I already paid a hundred. And then they're telling me you have to buy three additional games. And if I didn't, I said, "Well, what if I don't do that? Do I get the pre-order money back?" They're like, "No, no, no, that was the down payment. You don't get that back." And I was like, "These people are fucking assholes. I hate GameStop. I hate EB Games. Those stores suck. I never support them unless I absolutely, absolutely have to, like some sort of exclusive thing." But anyway, so I had to buy three games. It wasn't Halo, though. I did not buy Halo at launch. I never got why people jerk off to it. I just never got that. But the game I did pick, and you guys are going to laugh, and totally rightfully so, I picked up Shrek. Because I'm an idiot. I picked up Shrek. Um, <laughs> now, there was slim pickings at the launch for the Xbox, uh, which is usually the case. You know, launches traditionally don't have a shit ton of games. So, and since I had to pick up three, I grabbed it. I think I also grabbed Tony Hawk 2X, because Tony Hawk was still good at that point. And I don't remember the other one. Um, the only reason I had this one even comes to mind is I remember playing it and being like, oh, this sucks. And then I had a friend come over, and he thought it was really good. And uh, then at one point, we, uh, we took a trip up to Wisconsin to my uncle's cabin, and we were just hanging out there playing video games. And, he, you know, we brought the Xbox, and he brought this game. He, well, it was mine, but he brought it. Uh, and he, I'm not kidding you, he played the game for 30 hours straight. You know, he powered through it with coffee and everything. He did not sleep. And I was amazed by that. And I remember at one point, he just goes, yeah, I just hear this, Ugh! and I'm just like, I look over and he's like, this game sucks. And I'm like, congratulations, it only took you 30 hours of straight gameplay to figure that out. So I just thought that was funny. But uh, yeah, for the first year, I really didn't use the Xbox much. Uh, which is normal for me. I, I, when I pick up a game console, usually for the first year I don't do a whole lot with it, which I know, that's early adopter syndrome. It's kind of like, well, you, why'd you buy it then? It's just what I do. I just, I pick up consoles right away just to, you know, to have it and to experience it and get, you know, just get used to it. I don't know. It's just my way of going about it. Uh, and then of course I'll pick up the killer apps as they come along. And the first one that really struck was of course Shenmue 2. Now, Hands down, my favorite game of all time. But I like the Dreamcast version a hell of a lot better. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of that because, uh, you know, I talk about Shenmue enough. But uh, if you have the option, play the Dreamcast version. But I am one of the few people that actually bought the Xbox version right away. And I maintain that the reason this game was unsuccessful was because nobody owned an Xbox at the point when this game came out. But, uh, yeah, that is what it is. But, uh, yeah, so I love this game. And you should play it, but you should play the Dreamcast version. Now, as time went on, we saw some other cool things come out of the Xbox. We saw some other exclusives. Uh, Rare, if you remember them, they were bought by uh, Microsoft from Nintendo. And I think Nintendo had the last laugh because, really, this game was about the only thing they released that was worth a damn. 
which was basically Conquer Live and Reloaded. It was the uh, re-release, essentially, remake from the ground up of Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Very good game, but that's, of course, because Conquer's Bad Fur Day was a good game. Um, very, it's kind of rare now, actually, no pun intended. Um, yeah, really awesome game, and uh, we, I was really happy that they actually went ahead and did this, because it's really cool to have a game like this. We saw some other things that were interesting with the Xbox. This blew my mind when it first happened. Uh, Sega GT 2002 and Jet Set Radio Future on the same disc. So weird. Uh, the other thing about the Xbox is it was largely the Dreamcast's spiritual successor. Because you have to understand, at the time when the Dreamcast tanked, Sega had a lot of games in development for the Dreamcast. And they didn't want those games to go to waste, so the easiest console to port them over to was the Xbox. And of course they had the best relationship with Microsoft at that point, because back then they were still enemies with Nintendo. Sony had just kind of driven them under, is the way they saw it. And Microsoft had been helping them. I mean, a lot of the Sega stuff in the first few years of the Xbox are basically unfinished Dreamcast games, or in some cases, finished Dreamcast games. So, that was just interesting. That was another reason I think I kind of got behind it. Um, now, other multi-plats that I think are amazing are Star Wars Battlefront 2, for example. Now, this is one of the games that, I mentioned this in the first video of this series, this is one of the few games that did DLC right. You know, they had a complete game, it was awesome, and after it was successful, they said, you guys really like that, you know what, we're going to release some extra content, some of it will be free, you might have to charge a couple bucks for other parts, but uh, you'll, you'll like it, it uh, it's good stuff, and it was, it really was and it stays on your console forever unless your hard drive dies. But unfortunately, not reacquirable, unless, ironically, you mod your console. Uh, now another one right here, Second Sight. This is also on the PS2 and the GameCube. I can't recommend this game enough. This game is like a $3 game now. It's on all those consoles. It is an awesome game. John Baddock awakens from a coma with no memory. What he doesn't remember isn't pretty. A spec ops mission gone wrong. Capture, bizarre brain experimentation. He also knows uh, he possesses unimaginable powers, paranormal, psionic powers, armed with these abilities. Vatic must unravel the truth of his past and destroy the military cons conspiracy moving in against him. I'm telling you, this game is the shit. I loved it. Um, but again, a multiplat. It's made by the people who made Time Splitters, by the way. Again, a multiplat that was just vastly superior on the Xbox. And uh, that's, you know, largely because the, again, the Xbox had the hard drive ability, it had the better just hardware in it. And. It also, and this is coming to light more now, it had vastly superior video capabilities, or quality, um, as far as video quality, for image quality of the games. You know, um, like I mentioned in the first episode of this, all four of these consoles are capable of enhanced definition, but it's, it's varying degrees of it. Uh, the Dreamcast, of course, had VGA, and it looks very nice, but it's not necessarily practical. VGA isn't necessarily practical. The PS2 is capable of it, but it doesn't look good. And the GameCube is, of course, capable of it, but it's, you know, cord, the cables are incredibly expensive. But the Xbox, the video quality is really good, and the cables are very affordable. And there's no reason, if you have an Xbox, not to get a set of component cables. You know, most of your games, almost all the games are capable of 480p, and some of them even go up to 720p, naturally, without any kind of upscaling. They, they look really damn good. So, yeah, definitely... Uh, a solid experience there. And then uh, another thing about going back to modding a little bit, like I mentioned, you can play region, uh, you can play imports and stuff. And I only have one. I have uh, Puyo Pop Fever, which now that I think about it, with the exception of this, a couple of 2K2 sports games, this is the only multiplat of the entire generation. This was on the PS2, the GameCube, the Xbox, and the Dreamcast. It was the final game that Sega themselves made for the Dreamcast. So, it's cool, but for some reason the Xbox version only came out in Europe. Um, I didn't understand that, uh, but it is here, it does exist. I actually don't have any Japanese games for the Xbox, and I think that's pretty normal, because the Xbox, as much as it did, it did okay in North America, did okay in Europe. It tanked like shit in Japan, because they were just not willing to accept it. The other thing about this console is that it had a somewhat of a short lifespan, though, because... Microsoft did this retarded deal with NVIDIA, uh, where NVIDIA, I believe, supplied them with graphics chips, and NVIDIA never gave them any kind of reduced rate on them, um, which was part of the contract that apparently Microsoft didn't read properly. And it meant, in the long and the short of it, is it meant that they could never drop the price of the console without Microsoft themselves just personally eating it, 
constantly eating the price, and they had to do that. So the Xbox was actually a sadistic failure in every month. It, it failed constantly. With It never drew a profit, save for one month of its entire lifespan, which was November of 2004 when Halo 2 dropped. It was the only time the Xbox ever turned a profit in its entire life. Which is unfortunate because it meant as soon as the 360 came out, they dropped this console because they, you know, they really did not keep it alive for much longer. You know, they cut off live support, Xbox Live support, I think in 09, and they stopped making games for it, I think in 05 or 06. Um, I know some sports games got released as late as 07. Um, it is weird to think that, though. I mean, 07 was the same time when Sega officially stopped licensing anything for the Dreamcast which is the same time Microsoft stopped licensing anything for the Xbox. Uh, and that's weird, isn't it? I think that's also when the GameCube stopped, too. PS2, of course, lasted until, I think, 2013. But um, anyway, yeah, so it uh, is a great console in of itself, and it's unfortunate that it doesn't have perfect backwards compatibility with the 360 or the Xbox One. Why this, the Xbox One does not play original Xbox games is fucking beyond me. That, that console easily would have the power to emulate this shit. I, I just, I wish they would do that. But uh, that has nothing to do directly with this console. So that's kind of it. That's uh, my thoughts on the Xbox. I think it is a, a great game console. But it's another one of these things, like the PS2, that really set us in this direction that is not necessarily good. Namely, in this case, DLC on crack. And this console is actually the first one that was capable of firmware updates. Um, firmware updates are nice, but... If you end up with a console that, after servers are down and everything, and uh, the console never had updates to it, then it's a permanently gimped console, which is annoying. Um, but yeah, that's that, that really is kind of it. Uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you. I like the console, and I would recommend it. Um, that's about it. See you guys later, and thank you for watching, and please stay tuned to uh, Part 5.